good afternoon. Could we have the, the speakers? Good afternoon. Yeah. So uh, welcome to this uh, to this meeting uh, from the SILAD uh, and the Spanish Academy of Dermatology and Mineralogy. This is the ninth year that the AED invite us to participate in this uh, educational day, and it's a real pleasure to share for the first time this meeting with our brothers from from Silat. So it's, it, it's a, a new experience and I, I am sure that it will be very successful. I think that we are very lucky because we are excellent speakers today and different topics very interesting. Um, imagine uh, monkeypox, uh, skin color, so many very interesting topics that I am sure that the speakers will be excellent in, in all of this. I would like to thank all the people that um, has made this uh, uh, possible, especially Professor Julian Conejo Mir that has coordinated all the speakers and, and, and to, to do this excellent uh, program. And also uh, thank you to, for, to the people from, from CILAT. And thank you to all of you for being here and also the people that is following this um, symposium uh, by streaming. Um, I hope you enjoy the, the meeting and, and I give the word to Professor Jose Luis Lopez Esteparán. Thank you very much, Yolanda. It's a great pleasure for me to share with all of you this session. One plus one is more than two in this case, in the Spanish Academy of Dermatology and Thilat to share this uh, symposia. I'm very happy to reach this agreement that I'm quite sure that will grow in the future. And we are happy also because we have a great speaker among us that are going to review the most topic, the more trendy topics in dermatology today. I would like also to thanks to all the teams from Spanish Academy and from Thilat that uh, has allowed us to be here. And I also have to say that uh, for those that are not attending here, we have the Thilat RPP to follow us uh, in real time. And also the Spanish Academy has the uh, device just to allow Spanish people to follow this session. Uh, this international symposia is uh, the first time that two societies held this in the American Academy meeting. I hope American people could see how Spanish and Ibero-Latin American uh, dermatology is just now. I think we are in the top 10. Um, I also have to thank all the speaker and all my colleagues that share this chair, this table to conduct this session. So thanks to you. Thank you very much. And now it's my great pleasure to call uh, Dr. Mariel Isa Pimentel. She is a very distinguished uh, dermatologist in Republican, in Dominican Republic, and she is going to talk today about different perspectives on cutaneous pathologies in dark skin. So welcome, Mariel. Thank you for coming, and all yours. So good evening. First, I want to thank the organization committee for this kind invitation to talk today about this important and interesting topic, such as the different perspective uh, on cutaneous pathologies and in skin of color patients. So the first thing we have to do if we are going to talk about skin of color is recognize the difference on dark and on white skin. And the difference is in the structures of color skin, although we know there are still some controversial concepts and the need for more investigation and more studies. Variations in the presentations of the different uh, pathologies <laughs> and changes depend on the variations in the epidermis, in the dermal, epidermal junction, in the dermis, and also in the epidermal appendages. 
When we talk about the semiology of dark skin, one of the main characteristics is the absence of, <coughs> of erythema that we get to see in these patients. We get to see more dark, more brown, more violet color. The pigmentation lability, the increased tendency to hyperpigmentation that we get to see a lot, a greater tendency to develop infrequent responses to, pattern, to numerous and diverse uh, pathologies, larger melanosomes, more aggregation of them, even when we know there are no racial difference in the number of melanocytes, however, no, we know that the number of melanocytes can vary from a patient to another patient, from an anatomic area to an, on another anatomic area. Other characteristics are the greater thickness of the stratum corneo, the natural protection from ultraviolet radiation, and increased transepidermal water loss that can lead to cirrhosis and also decrease skin hydration, an increased number of sweat glands that may increase the developing of hydrogenated suppurativa that we know is, it tend to be more aggressive in people with a dark skin, a better inhibition of bacterial proliferation, also a less number of hair units with fewer cuticular layers less elastic fibers that anchor the hair. The hair grows more slowly in these patients. Also the color pattern, which is very usual to see, more fragile, breaks easily with lower water content. Increased vaso secretion that may provide better moisturization of the skin and also better thermoregulation of this. Larger fibroblasts, which may, which may contribute to the prevalence of keloids, the mutation and difference in filagrin and filagrin 2 that can lead to persistent atopic dermatitis in dark skin children, a significantly lower level of ceramides. That point is still controversy, the amount of lipids in white skin or in dark skin. Thicker dermopidermal dungeon that sometimes can provide us a little bit of answers of why skin of color patients has like late signs of aging. So what about the pathologies that are very common in dark skin? Um, many of them are common in our practice, like keloid acne or pseudofolliculitis barbi, keloids, dermatosis papulosa nigra, and also tractional alopecia. So we are going to talk a little bit about them and see some Kids. pictures. Um, pseudofolliculitis barbi, we know, we know this because it's very common in our practice, is a non-infectious inflammatory condition. And we know it's because the hair, the core of hair, penetrate the walls of the follicle and am themselves back into the follicle on the skin. It can occur in any hairy area. And sometimes when we get to see these patients, this is an 18-year-old male, he plays baseball, he has a high intake of vitamins uh, with a vitamin B complex and everything. So sometimes we have to talk to ourselves, is this an acne eruption, is this acne, or this is a pseudofolliculitis barbi. But when we get to see the classic uh, lesions in this, the curved hair, the pustules, the inflammatory papules, and sometimes the scabs, and all the lesions around the area uh, where the patients shave a lot, then you get to do the right diagnosis. The acne keloidalis nuca is also quite common to see, it is almost the same pseudofolliculitis barbi, and with some spontaneous cases that we get to see in practice with firm papules, pustules, nodules, if we don't get to talk a lot with our patients about this, about stopping shaving that area, then we know it's going to become a chronic condition and can develop even uh, very bad and big keloids. Um, sometimes uh, diagnosis is very challenged. When we get to see like these cases, of, like this one, 29 year old male with a six month history of pruritic plaques on his neck, no history of papules, not history of pustules. So is this a acne keloidalis? No, it's not. We don't have acne, we don't have papules, we don't have pustule, we don't have scabs, uh, and we don't have that chronic condition. So we start asking ourselves, what is this? A lichen simplex, keloid, a typic psoriasis maybe? But sometimes if we get to see these lesions closely and we get to see mm -hmm. the black spots in the lesions, then we can do uh, some studies like uh, mycological direct exam that we know is very easy. And this is a case of chromoblastomycosis, which is also very common uh, in uh, our country. 
palmar plantar macular hyperpigmentation. Uh, it is quite hard to say it in English, but it is something that we have to be aware about because it is very common and has too many etiology factors, too many causes, and too many differential diagnoses. And one of them, uh, it is important for us because it is a secondary syphilis that we know that sometimes when we see this uh, brown spots in the palm, in the soles, we can not think, uh, we can't stop thinking about a differential diagnosis, the secondary syphilis that we know uh, is uh, a great, great uh, pathology that imitates a lot of different uh, pathologies. This is another case of secondary syphilis. What we get to see in books is a rough red and reddish brown rash. That's the common description, but when, when we get to see the patients, it is not what we see. We see this brown <coughs> spot, a lot of lesions, and sometimes maybe the first diagnosis that we are going to think in these patients is a drug eruption or a drug reaction more than secondary syphilis. This is another case of pal palmar plantar macular hyperpigmentation, a 63-year-old male. He came to the clinic because he says he has more brown spots on his soles and pain in the right side when stepping. But when we did the physical exam of, the, of this patient, we noted an inundated area uh, on the touch and some like scab spots uh, in the middle of the lesion. So we took a biopsy and uh, for us it was a surprise because it was, it was an eumycetoma. We are going to hear about the eumycetoma later on uh, in this session. Um, on keloids, we know keloids formation probably are because of the hyperactivity of the fibroblasts and the decreased activity of collagenase enzyme. It is quite common to see keloids in a skin of color patients and for many, many, many reasons. That's why we have to be careful with any treatment that we are going to provide uh, for those patients because they tend to do more keloids than the rest of populations. And sometimes even keloids can be challenging in the diagnosis because we can uh, think about different pathologies like this one, segmental neurofibromatosis or keloids. What is this? Uh, what about toxidermia or drug reactions? When we get to the books uh, and we read about this, it says that sometimes those uh, drug reactions are looked like grayish or grayish color, uh, like some gray color. But when we look at about the skin of color patient, it is not easy to acknowledge this uh, kind of gray color. So it is very hard. Like the patient on your uh, left is a patient from Dominican Republic that uh, he is a policeman, and he says that he has been quite a lot a long time uh, going from dermatology to dermatology, ask him then why I'm getting darker. And the only thing that he was getting back is because you take a lot of sun. But it, was, it wasn't because of that. It, he applied a cream that produced this kind of toxidermia. The patient on the right is a patient that of course we can th see the full changes and it is quite easy to do the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Another patient that came to the clinic, a 40-year-old female with no control, uh, lighting cream using all the time. So she came because she was getting darker. That was she says. But when we do the physical exam, we always all, uh, we all noted uh, actually the hair retraction, the follicular-like micropapules, uh, also the grayish color on the face, on the neck. So we ask, is this a drug reaction? Is this lichen planus pilaris, or this is just another case of the frontal fibrosing alopecia? So we have to look closely. We have to look closes, closely just to see the difference in the skin uh, color changes. O exogenous ochronosis is another thing that is very important uh, that we note because sometimes we need biopsy, even when we know that biopsies can be uh, a little bit hard for those patients. We have to do them because uh, exogenous ochronosis is not an easy diagnosis to do in a skin of color patient because sometimes it can get confused and even coexist with another pathologist like melasma, like this one. We, we needed the biopsy to do the diagnosis. But sometimes even with biopsy, even with the dermoscopy, we don't get to do the diagnosis. We don't know what's going on with these patients. We really don't know uh, what is causing these hyperpigmentations. 
And what about inflammatory conditions like psoriasis? When we talk about psoriasis, we know that psoriasis is less common in the literature in Africans and Afro-Americans and Asiatic patients. And when we get to the literature, it says erythematose thick plaques with wide adherent cross. But that, that is not really what we see in many of our patients. Uh, most of these patients have different presentations of psoriasis. If we get to see these pictures, we say, OK, it is psoriasis, right? If we see this, it is psoriasis. But if we see this, it's hard to do the diagnosis. When we have patients with this kind of extension, with this kind of lesion, with this gray color lesions, it is not what is described on books. Also, the thicker plaques are very common in skin of color patients, and it is not that well described. And different variety of presentations, rupeoid psoriasis, this patient with psoriasis and colon, ca colon cancer, and you can see like the violet uh, pigmentation, which is not that common to see. Patient like this one, is this that is this tractional alopecia? Is this tinea capitis that is common in our country? Is this an upsetting exophorian uh, folliculitis, or is just another case of cicatricial alopecia? So it's hard when we have these patients, because we know uh, what is going on, but we also know that this patient has been uh, using a different relaxer, different methods for uh, comb the hair. So it is hard, even with dermoscopy, even with biopsy, to do the differential diagnosis. Uh, in tinea capitis, it's the same. If we read the books, it says uh, blackheads with trichophytic tinea, or it says uh, sometimes uh, the hair breaks at different millimeters in the scalp. But some of these changes are not easily recognized because of certain cultural practice. So it is not what we are going to see. Carrion cells is the same greater tendency to develop cicatricial alopecia in skin of color kids. Tinea corporis also. Uh, the erythematous uh, plaques that are the, um, the typical lesion described in books. But what about the <coughs> blackish plaques, which is also another kind of presentation of tinea corporis? Another few cases of tinea corporis, different presentation, like this one, the atrophic purpuric plaques. We don't get to see that alone in patients. And what about this. This is a 52-year-old female with a pruritic erythematous plaque that says, she says it comes and go. So the differential diagnosis, maybe because of the pictures we saw before, tinea. Is this a chronic discoid lupus? Is this a contact dermatitis? Or it is just granuloma annulari? But for us, and the biopsy and the immunohistochemistry, uh, it, it was quite a challenge to see that it was a folliculotropic mycosis fungoide. Um, classic uh, tinea versicolor, the hypopigmentation in these patients, but we also have the hyperpigmentation, uh, tinea versicolor, uh, which sometimes is darker than uh, what we tend to see. Uh, another pathology that is common in the skin of color is the macular progressive hyperpigmentation. Uh, we we know little about it, and it is very common, but often misdiagnosed uh, in these cases. So what about this one? Is this the same? Is this the macular progressive hyperpigmentation? If we see the patient, maybe we say yes. It is the same, but it wasn't. It was an hypopigmented mycosis fungoides. And we have to be aware of all the changes that occur in this patient. This is another one, the disseminated plaques with an infiltrated appearance in these patients. It is hard to see the erythema. We don't get to see that, what's going on in these patients. So when we look at this patient, cirrhosis, the infiltrated plaques, the warty looking lesions, it is a drug reaction, chronic contradermatitis, atopic dermatitis, mycosis fungoides maybe, or a leprosy, because we have to think about leprosy. It was leprosy, borderline leprosy with compromised cellular immunity that we know those patients had, and also chromoblastomycosis. Different cases of chromoblastomycosis, different way of presentations, depending on the, on the skin of color, maybe, maybe not. It is the same agent, different presentations in the same year, different patients, of course. Sometimes you get to see the erythema, sometimes you don't get to see the erythema. Chronic discoid lupus, which is quite common to see and almost, most of the time, misdiagnosed with vitiligo, for example. But this is not melasma. This is also another kind of presentation of chronic discoid lupus. Um, 
Mibelis porokeratosis, which is quite common to see as well. The Noriega scabies, if we see these patients with the ye yellow type, uh, gray type cross, uh, so we get to do the diagnosis, and maybe when we get to see this, it is the same, right? It looks like the same, Noriega scabies, or maybe an atopic dermatitis, but it wasn't. It was also uh, a CTCL with different presentation. Lichen planus, I'm, all, I'm almost done. Uh, this is like the, the classical presentation of lichen planus, but it is not what we get to see in a, in a skin of color patient. So we have to be aware about these changes, right, just to make the right diagnosis. Lupus and lupus lichen overlap, different presentations in chronic lichenoid pithriasis. Look at the different form of presentation depending on the skin uh, color. Uh, what we get to read in books about pithriasis rosa, but what we really get uh, in our practice when we see these patients is quite different as of what is described. Chicken pox, scleroderma, sometimes it's easy to do the diagnosis, sometimes it's hard to do the diagnosis. and. Um, Many times we think about vitiligo when we see uh, the salty and pepper uh, sign that is classic in the scleroderma. Another kind of sclerodermas, and also, of course, we have to talk about squamous cell carcinoma with different presentations and contact dermatitis and erythrasma. So in conclusion, it is essential to our knowledge of skin of color uh, diseases grows a lot. Um, by increasingly our knowledge, we, Actually, we can uh, do the right diagnosis and early detections of some diseases. Many characteristic signs of skin diseases may vary depending on the skin complexion and color. And most of our residents and residency program are not trained in recognizing <coughs> the same condition in different skin types. There are still many studies to be done on the different in dark skin. And I end up with this, inviting you to Terracilat in Punta Cana on November. Thanks. Excellent presentation, Ariel. Let's go on. Next speaker is a, a true expert in monkey pigs. He, she is Alba Catalan. Uh, she is working in Barcelona in Platon Clinic. And he will talk about the, the Spanish experience with the uh, other pandemic, the monkey pigs. When you want that. Dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me to this presentation. I have no disclosure. From 1st January of the last year through 8th of March of this year, more than 86,000 monkeypox confirmed cases have been reported to the WHO in the six uh, WHO regions. In Europe, uh, although the majority of cases were detected in the summer and autumn of uh, last year, uh, it, this doesn't mean that uh, cases have completely disappeared. These are the cases detected in Spain in the last four weeks, and these cases cause us concern. <clears throat> Spain has been one of the most affected European countries with more than 7,500 cases reported. More than 1,000 were detected in the hospital where I work, and this has given us a lot of work. <laughs> but has also allowed us to have a very realistic view of, of what was happening uh, through Europe and also have uh, allowed us to, to participate in many works that have highlighted important data that, that I'm going to uh, share with you. Uh, in the first international article in, in which we participate, it became clear that many patients did not fit the case definition in use at that time. Uh, the, the case definition was later changed. Why? Because most of the patients had solitary genital lesions affecting only the genital or the oral areas, and not all the patients had systemic symptoms. Moreover, the proportion of patients with STI co-infections was high, making necessary to consider MPOX in at-risk persons presenting with traditional STI symptoms as proctitis. <clears throat> We also realized that primary lesions in the inoculation area were pseudopustles, papules that simulate pustules in which it is uh, impossible to scrap the roof and obtain pus, similar to other pox viruses. Mm. Most of the patients presented 
the inoculation lesions on the genitals, perianal, or the face. <coughs> And some patients presented, around 10% of patients presented only one, one uh, pseudopustular lesion. <clears throat> and sometimes the patients presented with multiple pseudopustular lesions. These lesions uh, are well circumscribed, deep-seated, often develop umbilication, <clears throat> are described as super painful, and take weeks to heal completely. Commonly uh, are accompanied by surrounding edema, and regional lymphadenopathy is often associated. Some cases presented perioral lesions, lesions on the tongue, which are usually circular lesions with a depression in the center or ulcerated lesions in the oral mucosa or lips. And we were the first to describe solitary primary lesions in the fingers. Few days after the appearance of the first lesions in the inoculation area, a secondary eruption of a small macula vesicula pustule crust can take place. These lesions were described by the patients as pruritic, more than painful, and take days to heal completely. May appear in the face, scalp, arms, legs, palms, soles, or the trunk, and frequently, not all the lesions were in the same stage of development. Unlike the previous outbreaks, Monkeypox uh, monkey virus uh, in the actual outbreak is thought to spread through close contact or sexual contact, causing predominantly localized lesions instead of extensive disseminated lesions. And it's important to know that the cl clinical presentation varied greatly according to the stage of monkeypox infection at the time of testing, and it was different if the patient came to have to our office in the invasive phase or in the eruptive phase. The most important differential diagnosis was with herpex simplex, syphilis, scabies, LGB, molluscum, varicella, folliculitis, MRSA infection, or impetigo. For most individuals, monkeypox is a self-limited disease with symptoms lasting from two to four weeks. But a, 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 a greater proportion of patients had complications as proctitis, 14 to 36 percent of patients presented with anorectal pain, tenesmus, purulent discharge, or bleeding, associated or not with visible lesions in the peri perianal area. 10 to 20 percent have presented with sore throat and difficult in swallowing, associated with visible ulcerative lesions on the palatine tonsils or the pharynx. These lesions were difficult to diagnose as monkeypox. The presence of penile lesions may be associated with a, a proportional edema or gross edema of the penile glands resulting in paraphimosis. This may require urology evaluation and the swelling takes weeks to resolve completely. Progressive swelling, pain, and worsening of ulcerated lesions may indicate a secondary bacterial infection that should uh, need uh, hospitalization and systemic antibiotics. <clears throat> and we have seen and published nine cases of ocular involvement, all confirmed by PCR. The manifestations were conjunctivitis, blepharitis, <clears throat> presence of papules in the eyelids, corneal ulcers, eyelid edema, or periorbital cellulitis. This requires management with ophthalmologists, and not all the patients have fully recovered. 10 to 14% of patients presented with maculopapular rash, and the possible cause is immunological phenomenon analogous to what occasionally occurs with other viruses, but it's important to always rule out uh, drug eruption and syphilis. Uh, in Europe, the actual outbreak affect predominantly male uh, with a median age of 38 years, but we have participated in this collaborative study with 62 trans women and 69 uh, cis women. Um, uh, the sexual transmission was suspected in the majority of cases, but also non-sexual transmission, including household and occupational exposures were also reported. Uh, clinical findings were similar to me, uh, self-limiting uh, genital and anal vesicular pustular rash, often involving the mucosa with or without systemic symptoms. But globally, uh, most of the patients are MSM, 
Uh, the percentage of patients with HIV is very high, but in Europe, these patients are well controlled. And uh, in the percentage of patients who are HIV, the prevalence of usually taking PrEP is very high. But it's important to know that the virus has no preference of sexual orientation, so this data may change with the, the spread of infection in the community. During the actual outbreak, few hospitalizations have been reported, and the reasons were to provide an adequate pain management, uh, to treat complications and for purpose of isolating of the patients. Most of the patients in the case series published survived uh, with supportive therapy, but some needed antiviral therapy. But during the actual outbreak, 111 deaths in all the world have been detected, six in Europe, three in Spain, uh, in patients with underlying conditions. And uh, recently we have published this uh, important paper uh, with patients with advanced HIV. The findings are really important. The median CD4 cell counts was 211 cells per cubic millimeters, and severe complications were more frequent in people with CD4 below 100 cells. Necrotizing skin lesions, pulmonary involvement, and secondary infection and sepsis. 28% were hospitalized in whom 25% diet. Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome to Mpox was suspected in 25% in those initiated or restarted antiretroviral therapy, in whom 57% diet. Three individuals had tecovirimab resistance. So clinician should be aware that initiation of antiretroviral therapy in persons with advanced HIV and Mpox could contribute to a possible death. And it's important to highlight to test uh, for HIV and CD4, CD4 testing in all Mpox cases, and that persons uh, at risk of Mpox with HIV and CD4 counts below 200 should be prioritized for preventive Mpox vaccination. Other ep epidemiological findings that I think are important, detection of monkeypox uh, virus uh, has been uh, detected in saliva, rectal swab, nasopharyngeal swab, semen, urine, and feces. And this explains a possible role of boiling fluids in disease transmission. But viral load was higher in lesion swabs than in pharyngeal specimen. This suggests skin-to-skin -skin contact is a dominant transmission route in Mpox uh, in this outbreak. And the respiratory transmission is probably less relevant. Asymptomatic infection have been reported, but appear to be rare. It's uncertain if these patients were completely free of symptoms or were, or were pausisymptomatic, but these findings raise concern that people with mild disease could contribute to the ongoing transmission. What is clear is that there are many questions not answered. <laughs> So uh, regarding uh, the, the viable virus in different body fluids, uh, regarding the, met the best methods for co the identify complications and managing complications, regarding efficacy of antiviral therapy, regarding the efficacy of the F uh, vaccine. And we hope next year we will have any of these uh, answers. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava, for this great overview of monkeypox manifestations and the latest data that we have available. Uh, I think that we will have some time at the end of the session for Perfect. any comment and question that you, people could have. And now let's move to the next speaker. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to Miguel Olmos. Miguel Olmos is a dermatologist based in Bogota. He's an expert in surgical dermatology, mostly on most surgery. He has been dedicated to this uh, type of surgery for many years, and he's going to talk about this topic. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Being here is a pleasure. I thank for this opportunity. My talk is about surgical approach with most surgery in challenging case in Latin America patient. First of all, dermatologic surgery should be integral 
shall be understand the anatomy and physiology of skin tumors. He must reconstruct. Sometimes imaging techniques may be required. Before surgery, the marcation is essential. There are very difficult cases processing MOS. They need five fragments in the first state. Another case need nine fragments in the first state. Another case need eight fragments in the first stage. The main step is tissue flattening of the margins. There are precise indications for MOS surgery. These tumors can be treated with this technique. Now I'm going to focus on basal cell carcinoma. So, which is the cure rate in difficult basal cell carcinoma? In less one centimeter tumors, recurrence rate don't differ between most surgery and wild local excision. Meanwhile, in tumor on one centimeter or more, most surgery has lower recurrence rate than wild local excision. Recurrence tumors are the main indication for most surgery. Since there is a small surgical defect in most surgery, it allows better aesthetic results. Which factor predictive or recurrence? The size, location, recurrence tumors, polydifferent borders, immunosuppression, perineural invasion. Tumor size is definitely a risk factor for local recurrence. Now I'm going to show you a giant basal cell carcinoma. These tumors are greater than five centimeters. She needed in the first stage nine fragment. She needed four stage of most surgery. I did a skin graft. This picture was two months after surgery. There are another example. She had Third tumor recurrence, she needed four stage of most surgery. I did a skin graft. This was a challenging because this patient is young. He had a tumor polydefinite borders. She needed a fragment in the first stage. He needed three stage of most surgery. I did a mustard flap and a little skin graft. This picture was one month after surgery. In this case, various facets to unit are compromised. She needed three stage of MOS. I did a Jutsu Yanagi. This picture is 15 days after surgery, 12 mo two months after surgery. In this case, it's very important in my techniques. He had a glove compromise. He received this body hip without success. He had a neck practice in nucleation. In the other hand, there wasn't bone compromise. He needed a MOS surgery. I did a skin, a mustard flap, cervicotoraxic mustard flap. This picture was one month after surgery. Now I'm going to focus on scamal cell carcinoma. These tumors, the metastasis in these tumors are 50% of the cases. I want to show you a difficult scamal cell carcinoma. The metastasis and the recurrence in these tumors are greater. If the scamal cell carcinoma has perineural invasion, it's very important adjuvant radiotherapy. This tumor, there wasn't bone compromise in this in, in polydifferentiated scamal cell carcinoma. I did a MOS surgery, three stage of MOS surgery. In this patient, is very important a, a bone, straight bone. Next, put a, a skin graft, and next, adjuvant radiotherapy. This picture was one year after surgery. This is another case of poorly differentiated scamal cell carcinoma. He needed four stage of most surgery. I did a skin graft, and after that, I do an radiotherapy. This picture was two months after surgery. This is an example for very close <coughs> scamal cell carcinoma. I did a most surgery, and the reconstruction made 
OC a, a giant OC. In this tumor, CT scan is very important because he had nasal bone compromise. Another view, the nasal bone compromise. In this case, head and neck practice, very big surgery. In the other hand, there's a don't uh, bone is compromised. There's, there wasn't bone compromise. I did a most surgery and advancement flap. Now I'm going to talk about lentigo maligno. It's a challenging because the margin and the histopathology are difficult to evaluate. I prefer to slow moss because it's cheaper and you have the support for dermatopathologist. This is a very, very difficult case because she had a lentigo maligno at radioermitis site. Lentigo maligno <coughs> was developed at the site of previous basal cell carcinoma. She needed two stages of more slow more surgery. I did a skin graft. This picture was one year after surgery. Dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. It's a low grade sarcoma with a slow ground rate and rarely metastasis. Due to its subclinical ground, extension is unpredictable. These tumors can be treated with this technique. Slow mosis is better. She, need, she needed three stages of most surgery. I did a skin graft. This picture was one year after surgery. It's very important to, to do in, in, in these tumors. Look, look, look this. One centimeter tumors can lead to 10 centimeters defect. Now I'm going to show you microcystic and nexar carcinoma. These tumors are rare, locally aggressive. The main complication is neural invasion. This is an example for microcystic and nexal carcinoma in upper lip. I did four stage of most surgery, the reconstruction. I made a bilateral perialar crescentic advancement flap. This picture was one month after surgery, one month after surgery. I'm going to talk about sebaceous gland carcinoma. It's very important. Ocular tumors have poor pronostic. E sebaceous gland carcinoma have, if the, the recurrence in, in sebaceous gland carcinoma in wide local excision are 36%. The re recurrence, the recurrence rate in most surgeries, 12%. She needed Four stage of most surgery. I did a muster the flap, recovered the the and posterior malar and, and, and skin graft, palate skin graft. To take home, most surgery is an excellent treatment choice for different tumors. A multidisciplinary approach is always useful. Thank you. I want to invite <laughs> I want to invite to all you at Cartagena next year. We celebrate Silat. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much for this nice presentation. And let's move now to a different topic, the topic of take images from the skin. And we have a, a real expert. Dr. García, Gar uh, Dr. Javier García Martínez from the Clínica Universitaria de Navarra in Madrid, Spain. I know that he's very enthusiastic about all the different methods that we have now to, to see our skin and one of the pioneers in Spain of the use of ultrasound <coughs> in skin diseases. So thank you, Javier, and he's going to talk about the image 
as the protagonist of the moment in dermatology, 3D vision, ultrasound, and confocal microscopy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Jose Luis, Julian, Yolanda, Yvonne. Thank you very much for, for all of you to, to be here. Um, I have membership uh, of the Imagine Task Force of the Academia Española de Dermatología, the GDA group, and I will try to represent all my friends and partners included in this group uh, talking about some diagnosis techniques in dermatology. In my opinion, the USA is the paradigm of innovation, and it's the perfect place uh, for this speech about innovation in dermatological diagnosis based on imaging. You know, every new technique cannot be considered an innovation. Innovation in healthcare requires adding a benefit to the health system or to the patients. Uh, then I want to discuss if these techniques, I will talk about these, are real innovations with you. Uh, well, for example, I suppose you heard about uh, artificial intelligence chat GPT. What do you think? Is chat GPT innovation? or invention? What do you think? Well, I asked ChatGPT about this speech, and I got some original ideas. For example, ChatGPT recommends talking about the relationship between the Spanish history of New Orleans and the innovation in healthcare. It's original, no? Well, as I am a great lover of the history of my country, I decided to listen to ChatGPT. And uh, in this way, I discovered that in the four decades of a Spanish government in Louisiana, and therefore in the city of New Orleans, was the, the healthcare was really enhanced, enhanced with the construction of the San Charles Hospital, San Carlos, for the, uh, the King Carlos III. Uh, and the benefactor was Andres de Almonaster e Rojas. No? One of the first hospitals, uh, the, the hospital was the first in the city. And uh, the Spanish also promoted massive vaccination campaigns in the 18th, 18th century. in in the United States and in South America. In, in the best innovation at that time was the, the smallpox vaccine. It's, it's incredible in that time. Uh, the Dr. Xavier Balmis, maybe if you don't hear about, about him, I recommend you to, to ask ChatGPT about Dr. Xavier Balmis. No? Now, you can decide if ChatGPT has been innovative uh, for me. If I'm boring you with this speech, ChatGPT no. is invention, but if I take your attention, I keep your attention, is an, a good innovation, okay? Well, the story class is finished, and I'm coming back to the imaging presentation. My objective is to be able to identify the real innovation in imaging-based dermatological diagnosis, because for me, imaging is an essential function in today's dermatologic practice. Based on my clinical practice, I don't feel comfortable in a monographic consultation of skin cancer uh, without a dermatoscope or without a uh, ultrasound. Uh, then I want to discuss if these techniques, all of these, are innovation. Hmm? Well, the first one is sonography. In Spain, uh, well, for dermatologists, ultrasound is learned intuitively because we are used to uh, seeing histological section. We, we are trained. In Spain, skin ultrasound has been used in many hospitals for 10 years. However, in the USA, it's still a novel technique for dermatologists. But new sonography apps such as elastography or intralisional ultrasound guided uh, procedures could be considered innovative. In, innovative. It, I have not enough time to talk about all of these apps, but uh, if you want to take a photo, uh, a photography, I, I think this slide summarizes the best apps in dermatology at the moment, okay? Well, starting with these sonographic apps, if I show you this picture and ask you about the, the diagnosis, most of you will tell me you need to touch the deletion, no? Most of you. But without the sound, we are learning to see what we used to feel, what we used to, we used to touch, no? If I show you this picture, this is a, a subcutaneous nodule, no? But this patient, is, uh, clinically, look, the lesion looks like a, a, a cyst, a strange, a strange cyst, no? But the problem, uh, well, we have discovered, we have discovered that this strange cyst is really a um, skin metastasis of melanoma. 
if we we must be beware of a strange cyst, no? and always use Doppler mode in a nodular lesion, no? for example. And in this case, ultrasound adds value. For this reason, we consider it's an innovative technique. In the case of melanoma, the usefulness of ultrasound has been demonstrated in numerous studies. Uh, this is a very good correlation between ultrasound thickness and the pathology breast loss. But ultrasound slightly overestimates the thickness uh, compared to the histological due to the inflammatory cells and retraction of the piece in formaldehyde. But uh, some authors uh, promoted the one-step surgical removing of thin melanomas based on dermoscopic images. But I think that it's better to use the ultrasound uh, because the relationship is better. Well, we also know that uh, ultrasound is a cost-effective test prior to sentinel lymph node biopsy and in the follow-up of lymph nodes in metastatic melanoma. But also, in non-melanoma skin cancer, ultrasound is also very important knowing the depth and layer infiltrated by the tumor. We will plan, when we know the, the layer affected, we will plan the surgery better. And obviously, it, it will also help us to know the anatomical relationship avoiding damaging these structures, vascular and neural structures. Well, also as a novelty, I can show you, uh, I pretend to show you, yeah. We are also using ultrasound in clinical trials to guide the injection <coughs> of oncolytic viruses inside the uh, metastasis or the lymph nodes. Now you can see here the needle, oh. Here is the needle inside the tumor, and I'm protecting this vessel. And in the next one, we check that all the content of the syringe is inside the tumor, not in the periphery. No? You can see the hyperchoic image. No? Mm -hmm. And for instance, we are participating in these clinical trials. No? And also in inflammatory diseases, it's very useful. And in, in adrenitis suprachiva, I, I think it's the gold standard uh, staging method uh, for HS because clinical examination underestimates the severity of the disease. Uh, the ultrasound examination modifies the therapeutic choice. And for me, it's very important for planning the surgery and the guide of international corticosteroid injection. For example, this patient, I, I can see this abscess, and I think this is an inflammatory nodule. I check with ultrasound, and I discover there is only one lesion. It's a tunnel connecting both lesions. For this, for this reason, the ultrasound has changed the staging of this uh, patient and the management of this patient. The first one is so important. And therefore, I consider the ultrasound it's a real innovation because it's easy to learn. The high-resolution sonography is not too, so expensive at that time, and ultrasound is very versatile and therefore adds a lot of value to my patients and, and to me. This uh, machine uh, fits in a, in a pocket. Uh, this is an ultrasound connected with my iPhone or, or tablet. And uh, it's the, 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 the price is, is reasonable. And the problem will be finding doctor's gown with so many pockets, no? uh, because we have only two hands no? for all this material. Well. But do you, what do you think? Hands up. Ultras, is ultrasound an innovation? Hands, hands up? Innovation? innovation. Or innovation. my invention? No, no. Innovation. It's innovation. 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 I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I changed the, the study. Uh, we talk about three dimension photography. At present, this digital photographic equipment that makes a body map in a few seconds, two seconds, uh, creating an avatar has been incorporated in some uh, Spanish centers, like the clinic hospital. No? Uh, for me, this is exciting. No? It looks like a wonderful machine. No? It's magic. No? But, however, at present, it doesn't prevent to the dermatologist to uh, re review the, the, the pictures, to take the dermoscopy uh, photographies, and uh, to take the diagnosis. And for, for this reason, I think it's not 
so good. No, it's not different for total body mapping. No, in uh, PhotoFinder, for example, uh, fa facial three-dimensional photography like Visia or Sit and Observe are very, very uh, interesting in a uh, for a marketing tool in a cl clinic, uh, a private clinic uh, in aesthetics, for example. No, because check the results of the procedures. But if there are currently companies that take photographs and print uh, 3D, 3D uh, miniatures like this in shopping centers, maybe it's reasonable that, to think that in the future people check, uh, take their, their molds autonomously in a shopping center, for example, no? uh, like this. No? Well, so hands up, is 3D dimension photography invention or innovation? Invention. Both? You, are, you have doubts? I have doubts about that. Maybe in the future, I, I suppose, this will be a very, very interesting telehealth tool. Uh, I think so, but not, not at this moment, not for me. Well, the next, the, does anybody in the audience uh, con use confocal microscopy? No? If somebody use, uh, cover your ears, please, because don't, you don't like it. The, the comments, I will see. Well, uh, the, this is an amazing technique. The, this has cellular level resolution, but the depth is too limited, only 200 microns. No? It's limited the epidermal to, the, to the epidermal pathology, and it's uh, expensive and difficult to learn, almost to me, uh, and it's a time-consuming technique. For this reason, maybe it's not the most mm, uh, useful technique, no? But on the other hand, ex vivo con focal microscopy is very, very interesting, no? Because uh, I think uh, it's too fast. It's more fast than freezing cuts in most surgeons, and this will be a very, very interesting, and it's more easy to interpret than in the, the in vivo. The ex vivo is more easy to, to, for, for us. So hands up, con focal microscopy is invention, or innovation? Invention? Innovation? Well, well, I also have doubts, but uh, I think it's more invention in the, at, the, at this time. Okay. Well, as conclusion, every new technique cannot be considered an innovation. Innovation in healthcare requires adding a benefit to the health system or patients. And ultrasound is a very versatile technique and easy to teach to dermatologists. And three dimensional photography could be a great innovation in the follow-up of molds, and confocal microscopy is expensive, difficult to learn, and had limited li indications. For this reason, I think ex vivo uh, confocal microscopy could be a great innovation for the most surgeons. Um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. And now it is for me a very great pleasure to introduce a dear friend of ours, and he is the head of the dermatology department in uh, Hospital Universitario de Nuevo León, and he is going to present today mycetoma and deep mycosis in migrant uh, patients. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to my friends, Jose Luis, Yolanda, Ivonne, y José Luis y, uh, Julián. Julián, mi gran amigo de siempre, for the invitation. So, uh, when Ivonne asked me to give a lecture, I thought she would invite me to give a lecture on lasers, surgery, cosmetics, but not. And she told me, you have to present something of mycetoma. But right now, I'm very happy to present some of our experience in my department, because we have a lot of experience. We have made a lot of international contribution with this disease. And my first uh, uh, article in the Blue Journal was done in this, uh, about this problematic disease as you are going to see. Okay, yeah. Could you give me the, the first one? No, 
Okay, so I'm going to speak about uh, neglected disease. Uh, well, this is my conflict of interest. And as you know, mycetoma uh, or madura foot is a neglected tropical disease that is a chronic granulomatosis infection of the skin of subcutaneous tissue caused by bacteria and by fungi. The bacteria is named actinomycetoma and the fungi is eumycetoma. And the most uh, common agents are nocardia brasiliensis when we talk about actinomycetoma and madurella mycetomatis when we talk about eumycetoma. I thought the true incidence of mycetoma is not known. Most of the cases fall between the latitude, the 50 degrees south and 30 degrees north, the so-called mycetoma belt. And the diagnosis is made by detection of grains, by direct mycological examination, histopathology, fungal and bacterial cultures. Here is uh, the highest incidence of this disease is in Sudan, Venezuela, Mexico, and India, as you can see. In Mexico, we have a lot of history. It started with Antonio González Ochoa. He named uh, Tinomises Mexicanos. Right now, we, uh, we know there is Nocardia Brasilensis, Fernando Latapi. The, he proposed its use of uh, sulfones in actinomycetomas. The very well-known Sheikh Maghreb and Hassan Fajal, they give a lot of contributions of mycetoma. And Dr. Oliverio Welsh, that you probably know, he was the former chairman in my department before me, but he uh, did a lot of contributions for this disease. As I, I uh, mentioned, the causal agents are eumycetoma or actinomycetoma. In my country, specifically, is actinomycetone the most, most common? I'm happy to tell you that because we can cure that uh, patients. And eumycetoma is a difficult, uh, very difficult uh, to treat. And it's more prevalent, uh, probably 90% of the world uh, uh, number of uh, mycetoma is caused by, by eumycetoma. Let me show you some uh, our cases. Normally, we're still seeing this kind of patients that arrived from our countryside. These are all, all, uh, our patients that we published uh, in uh, Plus Neglected Tropical Disease in 2016. As you can see, different uh, clinical variants and different uh, morphology of the lesions. Here, another kind of uh, disease with these nodules fistula and uh, drainage uh, drain sinus. Here, another uh, case of our department, another important case here. This is another uh, case uh, with uh, different uh, morphology that we saw a few years ago in our department. We presented this study uh, here, I think, at the American Academy a few years ago. How uh, climate, soil type, geographic distribution of mycetoma in our in the northeast northeast part of Mexico, we did this uh, cross-sectional study, and uh, this uh, also we presented here uh, the clinic characteristic uh, characteristic of mycetoma in uh, the northeast of Mexico. In the uh, we presented 34 cases, 31 cases of tinomycetoma, and three cases of eumycetoma. Only confirmed cases because sometimes the uh, biopsy, the cultures, even the PCR are negative. So how do we approach uh, the, those patients? We take a deep uh, biopsy. We do a direct KOH. We culture. Uh, we do uh, Im imaging studies. Uh, we the, uh, do uh, some uh, blood tests, at, like uh, anti nocardia brasiliensis antibodies, and sometimes or, or what we are doing right now, in all the cases, PCR. So for us, it's very uh, important the verification of, of grains so we can start uh, the treatment as early as possible. So we have as you know, very, uh, dif a lot of differential diagnosis. Some uh, are infectious disease, and some are uh, cancers or some uh, aggressive tumors that you, you can see, uh, you can differentiate. So the treatment uh, depends on the if the case is a fungal or bacterial agent. Omicetoma, as I was mentioned, is very difficult. We treat as with antifungals and surgery, and actinomycetoma, 
we, uh, if uh, the, we have a small cases, we can treat it with trimetropine sulfamethoxazole, but if not, uh, we describe, and that's where our contribution to the world, is the combination of trimetropine sulfamethoxazole plus amikacin therapy. And it is named Welch treatment in all the world. And in resistant cases, uh, we uh, require another combination that we normally have used, uh, amoxy, uh, amoxylin clavulanic acid, uh, moxifloxacin, and uh, other, uh, we have been used and we have reported uh, uh, the combination with lime solid, uh, imipenem, meropenem, and rifampicin. So the, uh, we do uh, a lot of uh, research in rats and uh, to see how it works, uh, we find that if you put only a, a, a sulfamethox uh, alone or amikacin alone, it doesn't work. It has a synergic activity when you put it together. So that's what I mentioned, the Welsh re regimen that we uh, started in our department like uh, 35 years ago. Yeah, and we, uh, the decision is, how uh, deep is the mycetoma? Do you have an organ or bone affection? Comorbidities, uh, economic situation in our countries, as you know, disease recurrence, adverse effects, and previous treatment. So uh, normally we treat if there is no involvement of bone, internal organs, spin region, neck, genitals, or head. We can treat only with bacterium of um, amoxicillin clavulanic acid. But if we have uh, the recalcitrant uh, cases, or we have a deep uh, mycetoma, or uh, that affects head, head, neck, genitals, or spine, we do. Uh, we start with the Welsh regimen. I'm going to show you some example. This with trimetoprim uh, and amoxiclab for seven months. This is uh, trimetoprim plus amikacin. We name it cycles when we treat it for three weeks, then it stop because you cannot give uh, amic amicacin, uh, amicacin for a long period because you can have renal or ear uh, dysfunction. So we stop for uh, two weeks and then we check e uh, the audition and we check renal function and then we start another cycle. And sometimes we have to keep four cycles. This is a, a when only with, with a cycle with trimetropin and, and uh, amicacin. This is uh, cases uh, uh, very difficult to treat because normally they have a uh, spine affection and uh, we have to be very aggressive with the treatment. As you can see, normally we do the uh, mycologic examination, the biopsy, as you can see here. This uh, is another patient. We culture, it was nocardia, and you can see after three cycles of uh, this drug, we see different uh, 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 clinical presentation, and, and this uh, lady, with, uh, she has a granulomatous uh, neoformation, multiple nodules, so uh, she, uh, we finally biopsy. Uh, it was an ocardi, as you can see here, and then we, uh, we took it, uh, we excised, we combined surgery, and then we uh, 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 gave her three cycles of netilmicin and trimetropin sulfamethoxazole. There's another patient I want to show you. Uh, uh, we treated it for like several uh, cycles. Here you can see the biopsy. We normally do antibodies. We culture it, as you can see here. And we found that he has astromylites in T2. And that's uh, the way we treat it uh, for like six months with all that, that kind of uh, drugs, moxifloxacin, etilmicin, uh, imipenem. And as after six months, he was almost complete, a complete cure. Another uh, lady, very interesting, as you can see, we reported with this lesion after a car accident, and we thought, what well, is having a pyogenic granuloma, angiosarcoma, a melanoma, foreign body react uh, granuloma. Finally, a, it was a mycetoma, as you can see here, we culture. It was an ocardia brasiliensis, and we treated it with trimetroprene and amicacin here after the treatment. And we reported this case in the International Journal of Dermatology. This is the worst case, just uh, as you want to finish with that. Uh, we received uh, like four years ago, we, they sent it from the central part of Mexico with this and we treat with everything uh, that possible, but finally every, everything was completely destroyed, muscles, 
bone uh, uh, ligaments. So we have, have, at the end, we treated with everything, and at the end, we have to uh, amputate that guy. And just to finish with uh, uh, mycetoma, it's difficult to respond, as I mentioned, to the treatment. Atraconazole and terbinafine are the most useful therapeutic uh, options in our uh, environment. Just to show you the difference between uh, eumycetoma and actinomycetoma, how we uh, approach then, as I was mentioned. Finally, we're doing almost to everybody uh, all those because we have to have the cases completed. Some of the uh, uh, eumycetoma uh, patients with brown grains, as you can see here. And uh, I just want to conclude that mycetoma is most seen in the mycetoma belt. Uh, the painless nature of the condition leads to delayed presentation, and the lack of diagnosis and treatment facilitates the endemic areas. Uh, additionally, it le le leads to negligence. And in general, actinomycetoma responds well to antibiotic treatments, where uh, eumycetoma requires a combination of, of antifungal surgery and have uh, some recurrence with that. That's some of our, our publications. We have uh, done a complete genome sequence of Nocarcia brasiliensis. Uh, uh, we have the, uh, uh, done the genome sequ sequence of Actino Madure Madure. Uh, uh, in, so we love uh, mycetoma. It's a pleasure to be here and to remember when Mariel was present, Rafael, his father, was one of the big leaders in my setoma in, in, in our country. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks so much, bro. It's, it's an incredible presentation. We have any experience, we haven't any experience in Spain about this. Okay, we move to Spain again. Next speaker is Mar Llamas. Mar Llamas is working in Madrid in the Princesa Hospital. And she is also included in the investigating committee of the CILAD. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So <laughs> she talked about therapeutics landscape in psoriasis. First of all, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. I'm very happy and very honored to be in such a wonderful joint meeting of IDUB and CILAD. And in the next 10 minutes, uh, we will review how all the advances in the therapeutic landscape in psoriasis has changed not only how we approach this disease, but also how we are understanding many other inflammatory diseases in dermatology that we usually encompass under the umbrella term of IMIT. What we will review would be a brief etiopagenetic introduction in order to see what are the main advances we are researching on psoriasis to go to something very exciting and in a, with a big development about the pustular psoriasis. And finally, to end on the new targets, uh, the ones that we will have very closely, but also uh, the ones that will come in next pipeline. Regarding the, the landscape, it's important to remember that we started considering the keratinocyte within the center of all the etiopathogenic of psoriasis. But with the time, we will, we would able to, to see that there were many other actors involved, and we would change completely our perspective from this TH1, TH2 simplified uh, system where we supposed to have all the polarized uh, diseases uh, within the spectrum in dermatology to focus in more specific cytokines, such as interleukin-7, or interleukin 23. At the right, it's uh, in Spanish on purpose because here I mean most of us, our mother tongue uh, is Spanish, is but we are giving all the lectures in English. You have all the therapeutic, all the drugs that we are using nowadays in psoriasis, the different anti-TNF alpha, the anti-interleukin 23, the anti-interleukin 17, and also the anti-PF40 ustekinumab. But uh, despite, just as a clinician, it would be enough just to remember all the commercial names of the dosing, to know if these are humanized or completely human, which are the targets, which are the posology, 
because it's enough to treat our patients in the daily life. As dermatologists, we usually push the dermatological research, and we are not happy just to knowing how to treat the patients and how to control them, but we are starting to understand how the different pathways involved in the etiopathogenic psoriasis uh, and the relative importance of every of these pathways are related also with the phenotypes of our patients, and perhaps this will be open, this will be open the, the, the mind of us to select more specific therapies for every patient. We are also unraveling the mystery on why when we treat a patient and we supposedly control the disease, the disease tend to appear in the same areas. We now know that there are very important cells in the epidermis that are the T cells, resident memory ones. We are starting to, to know how to distinguish them, how to characterize them, and we are also knowing that there are different ones, the T central memory cells, that are isolated in the blood of our psoriatic patients and that can be involved with other comorbidities such as psoriatic arthritis. To come back to the clinical grounds, we are having several clinical assays to try to approach in a more practical way to how we can treat our patients in order to try to modify these uh, memory cells in order to avoid subsequent flares. Both of them have given us a very consistent results. In the guide study, we know that if we treat the patient in the first two years of appearance of the disease, we have more opportunities to be able to control them. And stepping uh, clinical assays give us very consistent results. Of when we treat it with the drug, the new onset patient, uh, psoriasis patient, we are able to normalize much better the transcriptomic of the disease. This is also combined. Um, we have many drugs, but sometimes we don't know if all of them are working the same within the different cells of the immune system. And we have very nice results of this uh, eclipse sub analysis showing us that these uh, uh, cells can be uh, modulated differently uh, with different treatments. Here, uh, the two drugs compared were Guselcumab and Secukinumab, but you can see in the graphics how they differently change these resident memory cells, the, the, mem the, the ones involved in the recurrence of the disease, and the T-Rex. Uh, let's move now to the pustular psoriasis. Here, we, we know that uh, it's different. Uh, it's different in every subset we attend the patients. We know that clinically, uh, we will have a sterile pustules on erythematous areas. We know that uh, in an etiopathogenic uh, way of thinking, we will have a more innate response in, in this type of lesions. We will have an under-restrained activity of interleukin-36. And we are starting to use all this knowledge to treat differently these patients. In fact, uh, there are new drugs. Especesolimab is one agonist of the interleukin-36 uh, receptor uh, that is very useful for this. Uh, we, we don't have the drug uh, for usual daily uh, use in our patients for the moment, but uh, we have treated one year ago a patient because uh, she had a very severe uh, pustular psoriasis, general pustular psoriasis, and she required two uh, doses of the of the drug. The dosification usually is 90 milligrams separated one week apart if it's not enough with the first doses. And for the moment, she's doing quite well one year after without any other uh, flare of postural lesions. Of, uh, regarding the new targets, some of them are uh, already with us in Spain. At least we have, since December, bimekizumab. And this drug is important because it's the first dual inhibitor, and it's inhibiting not only one cytokine, but two different ones, in this case, uh, related in the family, the interleukin 17A and F, that are supposed to be in more quantity in the plex of, uh, in the plex of our patients with psoriasis. The efficacy of the drug is probably related with 
a deeper capacity of normalizing the genetic expression. And this is interesting because it also changes how we think about uh, the, the way of modulating the disease in our patients. In fact, this drug, despite being an anti-interleukin 17, has a posology more similar to the anti-interleukin 23, because at the end, when you are in attendance, you will use 320 milligrams every eight weeks to control your patients. Uh, let's go to one field that is very, very exciting in all the dermatology, the JAK inhibitors. Here, uh, the drugs are changing how we are treating the different autoimmune diseases in dermatology. But coming back to psoriasis, we also have a more specific one for this disease, that is allosteric modulation of TIC2. And the important things of this drug is that it's oral drug, but the results regarding efficacy are very similar to, to the ones we have known with ustekinumab, that it's a, thera a biological therapy we have used a lot. There are also other TIC2 inhibitors in clinical assays. We don't have time enough to talk about how this etiopagenic knowledge is changing the way we approach the comorbidities in our patients, but I want to tell you that we are also trying to know if the different treatments or uh, the different moment of introducing the treatments can change the, the life of our patients. And we have very promising results because regarding the, the psoriatic arthritis, we know that it's supposed to have lower incidence in the patients treated with biological therapy. So probably we are making things not so bad, despite still we, we need to know what's the best moment to, to use the drugs and if it will happen the same in all the types of patients. There are incredible uh, uh, therapeutic arsenal now for us, but there are many other things coming. I just want to, to show you two. The, nanobody technologies with Sonelli Locumab, that is a nanobody blocking same cytokines that Bimekizumab, and here the interesting thing is that we are not using immunoglobulins, so probably uh, it will differ uh, how the immunogenicity appear or how long the treatments can be effective. Another interesting thing that is happening a lot in oncology, but not so frequently in dermatology, but we will come and it will be with us pretty soon, is again dual inhibitors, but different families of cytokines. And there are some of them in, in research, netakin math, for example, is blocking both uh, interleukin A and also uh, TNF-alpha. Uh, there are many other ones, but uh, not so well evolved, but this gives you the uh, landscape I wanted to, to show you because this growing knowledge on psoriasis and this learning on how knowing about etiopathogenic and targeted therapies are moving a lot how we understand the disease and how we are able to control our patients is important not only in psoriasis despite we have focused the lecture in this but also in how we research in dermatology and how we are treating our patients and probably uh, is making a, a difference in, in how we will uh, uh, construct the, the future dermatology. Uh, this is Valladolid, my natural place. We are in New Orleans, pretty far away from here. But I wanted to, to thank also all the people in the GPS, the, the psoriasis group of the academy, because all of them are very active. We have a very nice group. We are making a lot of research, despite I decided not to put one after other article from the group, because I think this uh, type of lectures makes uh, people not working in psoriasis knowing what we are doing and we are, uh, what we are interested in. But uh, I would love to have a photograph of the group, but I was not able to find anyone in the airplane. I'm sorry for that. But thanks a lot to all the groups of GPS for all the learning and all the activities we are doing together. Thank you so much, Mark, for this great talk. Uh, nobody could imagine many, some years ago the change in, in the paradigm of treatment of um, psoriasis. Uh, perhaps it's the only uh, skin disease where we have so many 
uh, different treatment today. Uh, you have shown that still we, ha we will have many more in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for your talk. And now uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to the Dr. Horacio Cabo. He has just arrived from Buenos Aires. Uh, thank you so much, Horacio, for coming here. And as you know, Horacio has been the past president of CILAD, and he is one of the pioneers in, in dermoscopy. He has been working in dermoscopy for many years, and he's going to talk about this topic, and he's going to present us uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the topic is called Improve Your Daily Practice, Simple Tips on Dermoscopy. Thank you so much, Horacio, for coming. I'm sorry for no, sorry. taking you <coughs> here in so hurry. I, I, I couldn't change my clothes. I just arrived in. Sorry for, about the delay. Okay. The, the title of... And this is okay. okay. The screen is not working. Uh, the laser point. What is this one? The laser pointer. Or oh, can can you use? No. Who is the laser pointer? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. What is, which is better? This one. Okay. Uh, today, we will focus in extrafacial lantaio maligna, nodular melanoma, nibus associated melanoma, ear melanoma, and little red riding hood sign. Uh, only simple tip of this pathology. Okay, the first one. Extrafacial lentigo maligna, if you remember the lentigo maligna and the growth model for lentigo maligna, asymmetrical pigmentation of the follicular opening, circle within a circle, and dots and globules around their hair follicle are, are the, the best features of uh, dermoscopy, of the dermoscopy diagnosis for lentigo maligno. But on occasion, lentigo maligno could appear in other place. And we call that extrafacial lentigo maligno. We published this paper the, the last year and we study 69 patients and the clinical feature are this one, asymmetric pigmented macule, more common on, on the trunk, in low phototypes, sun damaged skin patients, older adults, history of skin cancer, and remember 17.5 of all lentio malignant cases are extrafacial lentio maligna. The typical asymmetric pigmented macule, brown macules, and the dermoscopy features are light brown, dark brown, blue-gray colors, angulated lines, hypopigmented eraser structural areas, regressions, and dermoscopy features of solar lentigo, solar lentigo in the periphery of the lesions. But the most important dermoscopy feature are angulated lines and erases or hyperpigmented areas. This is an example, this is angulated lines here and here, this one. This is a criteria of lentigo solaris and here are erases or hypopigmented areas. Again, hypopigmented areas with lentigo maligna and blue color. 
It's possible to a little dip down the, the light, this one. And here, blue color. And as examples, asymmetric pigmented macule, brown color, and under thermoscopy, again, angulated lines, perfect, thank you, and erases area. And this is a older patient with these particular lesions, and if you see, this is during one, uh, one hour, and, uh, one year and a half follow-up. At the beginning, this is an extrafacial lentarium malignant. It's impossible to diagnose under thermoscopy. But at the end, one hour and a half is very easy. Angulated lines, erased areas, lentario solaris at the periphery. Here, uh, so and so, and this is difficult also. So uh, at the beginning, these lesions uh, are very, very similar under thermoscopy. Uh, to the len uh, lentigo solaris, solar lentigo. So, remember thermoscopy features, angulated lines, hypopigmented, eraser or structural areas. These erases areas, uh, Jose Luis published a, a paper about this, are because the retter ridge uh, are not angulated are uh, compressed with the, the nest of melanocytes, and we can see pigment network or any, any kind of network. This is the, the why we saw these erases areas. Second, nodular melanoma. Remember, melanoma leading cause of death among skin cancer, and 50% of all melanoma are breast load <coughs> more than two millimeters, generally in patients with few nevus, and the early detection, when they are still thin, could improve the prognosis, because one, one of the, the best indicators of prognosis in melanoma is the breast loss index. The question is, is it that possible? Yes, we published this paper in 2020, and we study nodular melanoma, uh, thin nodular melanoma, breast load less than two millimeters, and <clears throat> thin melanoma on occasion is, uh, didn't show the, the specific criteria of uh, nodular melanoma, um, we, <coughs> we find that the irregular brown dots and globules, irregular structures, blue areas, ulceration, the greater ulceration, the greater the breast lobe, of course, white shiny areas and lines, brown color, uh, only 13% are blue and black color. Remember the rule, blue and black rule for nodular melanoma, the, the, the more frequent color here is brown color, and dotted vessels. And this is one patient with few nevus. Here we remove a nodular melanoma. This is the clinical image, a close-up of the clinical image, and this is the dermoscopy image. And here you can see brown dots and globules, blue areas without structure, maybe ulceration, superficial ulceration, white shiny and lines, brown color, obviously, and here, this with dotted vessels here <coughs> in, in, in this picture. Another patient, few nevus, here, remove a, melan a nodular melanoma, this is the clinical image, and this is the dermoscopy image, again, irregular brown and dots here, irregular blue est structural areas, ulceration, white shiny areas and line, brown color, and 
here you can see dotted vessels again. This is another example, brown color and this, the same dermoscopy features. And so remember, nodular melanoma, thin nodular melanoma, can show irregular structure of blue areas, ulceration, shiny areas and lines, brown color, and dotted vessels. The third is nevus associated melanoma versus the novo melanoma. Remember, the, this uh, nevus uh, go to dyspleptic nevus and then to melanoma. Nobody believe in this one today. Uh, melanoma could be de novo melanoma in 70% of the cases and associated uh, a nevus in 30% of the cases. In, nevi, in nevus associated melanoma, there are two different types. Melanoma arising in the center part of the mole of the nevus or melanoma growing next to the mole. When melanoma arising in the center of the mole, in general, congenital nevus, and when melanoma grow uh, <coughs> next to the mole, are uh, in uh, at quite at carrying nevus. And congenital nevus associated melanoma grows in the center of congenital nevus, commonly in young patients with many nevus. Predominant location is the trunk and lower breast and better prognosis. And Non-congenital nevus associated to melanoma grows at the periphery, adjacent to the nevus, common in older patients with thin nevus. Extremity is the, the most frequent location and high breast higher and worse prognosis. This is an example, melanoma in the central part of the nevus, is congenital nevus. Another example, Another example. And here, this is melanoma in situ. This is the melanoma in situ. And this is the nevus. Here, you can see a pigment network, maybe a typical pigment network, but here, some streaks, some, uh, a typical pigment network, and some irregular brown globules in this area. Another example. This is the melanoma, and this is at quite nevus. Re remember, maybe you can see this is a congenital nevus. No, this is a, some a, at, at quite nevus could be the, the same dermoscopy features of congenital nevus. The, the difference is um, under histopathological examination. Here, the same. And here, another example of <coughs> melanoma arising in acquiring nevus. So, remember, when melanoma arises in the congenital nevus, in the central part of the nevus, young patient with many nevus on the trunk and lower breast lobe and better prognosis. And non-congenital nevus grows in the periphery of the, of the nevus, Older patients, no young patients, with few nevus in extremities, in the <coughs> extremities and a breast low, higher and worse prognosis. For external ear melanoma, it's more frequent than expected. <coughs> we, we published this paper with eight cases. Uh, it's, it's interesting because <coughs> the ear, uh, not, not always we check the ear. In, in, in women with the hair, maybe the, the ear is, is, is covered with the hair, and maybe I forgot to check the ear. So remember the melanoma could appear in the ear, it's not uh, so rare. And we, we, uh, we published eight cases, and remember, it's more, uh, more frequent localization is the helix. 
uh, the dermoscopy feature are the, the same dermoscopy feature of lentigo maligna or extrafacial lentigo maligna. This pathological subtype is lentigo maligna. It is very, we emphasize the importance of routine clinical examination of the ear. No? And this is a new case uh, during the pandemic era. This is the mask. And again, it's very similar to lentigo maligna. The, the growth model of lentigo maligna applied perfect for this case. And remember the localization, the dermoscopy feature, the histopathological subtype, and the, remember to check the ear in, in men and women. And the last one is a little red ribbon hood sign. Uh, today, one uh, of the best way to, to check patient is using the dermoscopy approach. And the dermoscopy approach, <coughs> the first part is the signal to nevus because uh, the patient has a, a predominant uh, type of nevus and maybe between uh, these nevus appear one nevus that is different. And this uh, the, the, these different lesions, the, uh, we call that ugly duckling sign. No? Remember the famous tale, ugly duckling sign. And the ugly duckling sign could be under clinical examination or under dermoscopy examination. Under clinical examination is, is a good method to uh, check the patient with only with your eyes and see these lesions is different to the other. But the little red riding hood sign is only under the dermoscopy examination, no under clinical examination. Remember the, the famous tale here from, from this distance, little red riding hood is impossible to distinguish between wolf and the grandmother. But very close with the dermatoscope immediately recognize the wolf. Very, <laughs> very nice tell uh, when I was very young. Huh? Okay, this patient, this woman with a lot of nevus and between these nevus, one of these is a melanoma. Which is, it's impossible, believe me. And the majority of the nevus of the patient are this one, globular pattern, reticular pattern. But one of these, this is the dermoscopy feature. And this is a clear-cut melanoma. And the question is, which one? This one. And believe me, if you don't use the dermatoscope to check this kind of patient, you lose the melanoma. So remember the comparative dermoscopy approach with the signature nevus at the different lesions. Okay, remember in 2004, the Sick Board Congress of Dermoscopy in Buenos Aires, we co-organized with the International Dermoscopy Society and the CILAT. And okay, uh, you are welcome to to come to Buenos Aires. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for this nice and very uh, teaching uh, presentation. And we have to move to the next speaker, okay. who is our last speaker, but not the least, because he's a real master of, uh, of lasers. We have Dr. Rubén del Rio with us and he is going to talk about the use of lasers for anti-aging. So thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Yolanda, and thank you for coming here at this hour, the last but not the least. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So I will talk you to, to you now on lasers.
So this is an update on laser sun rejuvenation or anti-aging <coughs> treatment. This is the role of lasers. If you, if, you, if you use lasers, you have to know all the, the new lasers in the market, the new kids on the block and the old ones. I don't, I don't have conflict of interest in this presentation. And this is uh, nowadays the lasers for aging skin. This is ablative, full and ablative and fractional lasers. It's a CO2 or an erbium jack lasers. Non-ablative lasers that are very common nowadays in Spain because in summer and in spring sometimes, and also in phototypes, high phototypes, it's difficult to use the, the ablative fractional lasers. And the new kit on the block is the nano and pico full or fractional lasers. This is an excellent picture of all the lasers that we use in, in dermatology. And then the non-ablative tissue heating, like photobiomodulation, is also used. The uh, full ablative resurfacing that we used in the past, in the 90s, but very, very, very now is not used, not very common, because it's a long period of recovery. The superfractional, the superficial fractional ablative resurfacing, and the ablative fractional resurfacing uh, deeper, and the non-ablative fractional resurfacing. You can use all these kind of lasers in your practice. But as dermatologists, we have to know the different mechanism to, to know in every patient how to use it. And not, onlo, not only for effective use, also for safe in our patients, because it's an aesthetic procedure sometimes, and also in scars nowadays, we use a lot of lasers. So you have to understand, to understand the histologic laser and tissue interaction. This is a very interesting paper, a systematic review, a comparative of CO2 and erbium jack. If you use both, if you uh, are planning to buy a laser, uh, a fractional CO2 or erbium jack laser, uh, the conclusion is that CO2 laser appear to be more efficacious, but erbium jack was associated with less complications. So ablatic fractional lasers rejuvenate the skin by thermic effect, resurf resurfacing the outer layer as well as healing and also photobiomodulation. And the fully ablat ablative lasers are generally avoided in skin types 4, 5, and 6. This is a representation of histology. This is a deep mode and the superficial mode. As you can see here, the columns in the deep mode is about one millimeter. You can reach with the, ablative, with the fractional ablative lasers. So you have to know that more energy, the more deeper the treatment. And for superficial mode, you use like a peeling, like a superficial peeling. Non-ablative fractional lasers. So it delivers pulse with different energy and density levels. So you have to know the density to use about 5, 10, 15, and more. And that's induced problems of epidermal and dermal coagulation. Non is not vaporization, is not ablation. So it's a photothermal mechanism and the recovery time is spectacular. This is the representation of the non-ablative fractional lasers and very important, the density. So you have to know exactly what patients are treating in your practice, in your country, and use this, these uh, lasers with different densities and energy. This is a representation of histology. So you know it's not a column of ablation, it's only a thermic effect, coagulation of the tissue. And also the energy is very important. You are planning the treatment, you can use, for example, in this case, with this laser, 15 millijoules or 100 millijoules, and you can reach more deeper effect. Non-ablative uh, non fractional lasers uh, have minimal or non-epidermal injury. It's a short downtime, so it's, it's, it's called lunch treatment. Uh, people come to the, to the clinic and then can, go, can work again less adverse effects, and improvement in wrinkles, texture, and pigmentation. That is several sessions to, to reach these treatments. And hybrid fractional laser use both the ablative fractional lasers and non-ablative fractional lasers at the same time, simultaneously. And the most important now of this speech is the effect of LIOP, that is called laser-induced optical breakdown, that is a new, a new mechanism you have used pico or nano pico lasers, nano less than one or two nanoseconds to, to have this, this effect of pico lasers, to LIOP. Uh, the most important is that induced collagen and elastin, 
but require um, several sessions for rejuvenations. LEOP is a process of nonlinear absorption, and you have uh, for this treatment is such a high irradiance lasers for, and the mechanism is not thermic and it's not a vaporization. It's the called avalanche ionization of the skin, which caused the LEOP effect. This is the first paper, the first publication of the LEOP for ABEMA in the Journal of Biophotonics in 2012. You can see here the plasma effect, it's called the vacuoles. And next, 30 years, 30 years days later, the result was a new deposition of collagen and elastin. This was a surprise because the Pico lasers, in the first, the first Pico lasers was used, was used for tattoo remotion and for pigmented lesions. But now, with fractional lenses, we use for rejuvenation and scars. And this is the second most important paper in the literature. There is Tangeti, very known. Uh, dermatologist in 2016. This is important, the effect of the plasma of the vacuoles with the LIOP effect. Here in the, at the top, you see the vacuoles in the, in the epidermis, in this case. Vacuoles uh, are produced all, not also in the epidermis, also in the dermis, depending on different parameters. And then, one day later, in the, uh, 24 hours post, you see the, the injury is, is very low, and then the most important is the effect on inflammatory process and reaction by cytokines and the production of new collagen and new elastin. This is a very, very interesting paper with a 1064 nanometers picosecond laser. And you can see here the two different lens, lens, MLA and DOE, and the vacuoles are different with two, len two different lens and the energy. Big vacuoles with the MLA and small vacuoles with the DOA, e, depending, depending on the laser you can use. Here are the, the, the same. So now, this, this, these lasers are very common in, the, in, in South America, Asia, and, and countries with uh, phototypes, high phototypes. There are now, the first one was the Pico Alexandrite in Indonesian skin, this paper in 2022. And the most, uh, in Spain, we use a lot of 1064. That is very useful also for pigmented lesions and for tattoo removing. This is the, the different variables with lie of effect, depending on the wavelength, type of lens, the fluence, the focal distance, different lenses, and the spot, density, the tissue and the optical properties of the skin of the patient. And the indications, the most important is the non-invasive rejuvenation, I call semi-invasive rejuvenation in all phototypes, pigmented lesions, atrophic scars, pigmented scars, stria, and combined treatment in tattoos with full beam pico nanoseconds. And this paper is very interesting too, OCT comparing the CO2 laser and the pico lasers. With PICO, you know, we know that the diameter of the intradermal cavities increase with the exposure energy, and the intradermal cavities only exist at limited depth range. Different of the CO2 fractional laser that reaches a deeper skin with more energy. You can see here the depth, 200, 400, and 600 uh, microns, is not nanometers, it's microns, and the energy. So you see the holes with more energy are bigger and deeper. But in, on the contrary, with the Pico lasers, it's not the same. It's with less energy, the vacuoles are deeper. So it's a different mechanism than CO2. You have to know that. So the comparison of this kind of lasers, the LIOP effect, cavities were produced at shallow depth with higher energy. In contrast, CO2, the wounds and deeper depths did not change on the day seven. The recovery is very different with the CO2 and the pico lasers. You have seen in the, the first, at the top is the CO2, and the, at the seventh day, the, the, the columns of the thermal effect persist, and not with the pico lasers, with the fractional pico lasers, at the third day, is not, the recovery time is full. 
is 100% recovery. So in conclusions, my actual approach with lasers in my practice is full ablative and fractional lasers. Is all, I, I use only for severe aging in phototypes one or two. And fractional ablative laser for moderate and mild aging in phototypes one, three. And I use fractional pico nano lasers for moderate mild aging in phototypes three and more. And I combine treatments with non-fractional and fractional pico nano lasers for severe aging in phototypes, high phototypes four, five, and six with high fluence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Ruben. Once, once a year more, we have the, the tremendous uh, proud of, uh, to join uh, a session with, in, in this year with the uh, CELAT of the Spanish Academy during the Academy, American Academy meeting. We have uh, before excellent presentation, and maybe it's the moment for any comments or any question for the people, for the assistant. Comments or questions? Yes, Jorge. Uh, I have not used the, uh, the uh, Pico. Uh, do you see really big difference? Because they are very expensive equipment normally. And uh, do you think it's a real advantage to buy a, this kind of equipment compared? Because I, I, I get good results with only the CO2 fractionated. But if, my question is, do you uh, think it, it would be a good idea to buy the, the combined laser? Do you think uh, the results are that good? Yeah. Well, especially in, in, in your countries with high phototypes, I think it's, it's mandatory to buy nowadays the PIC or, or, a, or a good nano laser uh, device. And in Spain, for example, all women works or has social, mm, you know, so you, I, I use a lot of treatments non, with no downtime. So that's the most important. Because I use a lot of treatments in the past with CO2, erbium, full ability, fractional ability, and they don't, they don't want these treatments now. But you have to do more sessions to plan. A planning is very important to understand. And also for scars. Scars are very, very interesting, the, the results with, with the fractional pico nano lasers. Thank you. And this is a question for Dr. Horacio Cabo. Uh, these uh, melanomas were diagnosed with dermoscopy in digital follow-up or just in the clinical periodic revision of these patients? The patient that they would show? Mm -hmm. <coughs> no. All of these cases are on, on my office. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember some uh, patients in the in, in, in the first uh, visit, others in the follow-up. I, I don't remember exactly. But the, the problem with nodular melanoma is that the patient have few nevas, and for example, this kind of patients no. The, the campaign or, or, the, or, or the when uh, melanoma Monday and this, I, I have no nevus mm -hmm. and maybe one of these is a melanoma. I have a patient with uh, three different dermatologists say this is a dermatofibroma and it was another melanoma and, and with the moscopy it's very easy to distinguish. But the, the many people don't, didn't use their mask. Yes, yeah. I have a question for Alba Catalan, and I would like to ask uh, you what's the reason of this significant decrease in the incidence of this disease? It's very, it's a very interesting uh, question. Probably, uh, as I said, uh, most of the patients were a high risk population for STIs. So uh, uh, this is not a big group in our cities, 
it's a small group, and most of the patients were infected, were vaccine, or, and this probably make a herd immunity in the community that uh, allow us to decrease the, the cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Do you have a question? Dr. Stengel. <coughs> question for Dr. Jamas. Uh, thank you for your talk. I keep learning, and, and I always remember that at my age, uh, I remember uh, when we started with monoclonals and, and so on in psoriasis, and now we have a whole list of new drugs. But listening to you, and particularly when you mention the fact that now we have a combination of two of a drug that acts against two targets, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Because when all this started, I was told that monoclonals would be single drug, chronic therapy, and no more psoriasis. Now, we know that that's not true 20 years later, that we failed. We fail miserably with many monoclonals. We have to change the drugs. Uh, patients don't respond. Then you start a new drug. Now, what are your comments on these drugs that combine two targets? Uh, do you think that we are just looking for efficacy? Uh, because sometimes in psoriasis, I think that we should care for patients more than try to cure patients. Curing a patient means you start therapy and you cure the patient. Caring for patient means you start a drug and you care for the patient chronically. That is, you don't expect a cure. Now, in my view, we don't talk about this enough when we talk about psoriasis. And when now I look at drugs that target two or three or whatever targets, I think that perhaps we're overdoing it and we're trying to cure instead of care. And the difference might be important in immunosuppression, chronic immunosuppression, and so on and so forth. Are we curing or are we caring for patients? Curiously, Hippocrates said we had to care for patients. Thanks a lot for, for the question and Absolutely. the commentary. It's very interesting. I, I have the feeling that probably Louder. this. Louder. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now it's working? No. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot for, for the commentary and the question. I, I agree with you. Uh, so, probably uh, the results we have uh, got with the monoclonal antibodies in psoriasis are enough. But we have the, arth the psoriatic arthritis, where we don't have uh, such wonderful results. So probably we will use more these dual antibodies for other diseases. Psoriasis arthritis is the uh, one that comes to your mind easily, uh, where we are not able to completely control the disease by targeting one single uh, cytokine. In psoriasis, I agree with you, probably uh, this is not going to cure the patient. Perhaps the profile of adverse events will be worse. We still don't know, we don't have enough experience with that. They are very early clinical assays, but probably the risk will increase. And, and probably we will not use them in a basic way. For certain patients, the ones where you try every monoclonal and usually they fail and you are like, using your last mm. bullet for the patient, probably we will use that combined therapy, but there are just a small amount of patients, the ones that will need it. But for other problems like the psoriasis arthritis and other diseases, probably it's not enough just to block one cytokine, because at the end, the immune system is very related in many relationships between the different pathways so we, we, let, we are starting in psoriasis, but probably we will use it in other diseases uh, more than in arthritis psoriasis. It's difficult to, to know where it's going to, to work because sometimes you know these antibodies start with one uh, uh, disease and then they, they, they try to target many other diseases and in diseases they are supposed to work 
they don't work, and the opposite, so <laughs> it's very difficult to predict. So I, I feel it makes sense. It comes more from the field of oncology, where we have the problem that sometimes targeting one cytokine, we have a, a un, immune escape. Uh, in psoriasis will not be the, the main thing, but uh, will be also an important development in dermatology, because for the moment we are pretty far away of being able to cure psoriasis, despite all the advances. The, for the moment we are caring of the patients and we are carrying it quite effectively because we have very nice drugs for that. But still, they have importance for other additional related things, not probably with the, the, the patients with plague psoriasis conventional. Okay, thank you. I have a question for you, Javier. I am surprised because you don't speak anything about the artificial intelligence in, with image. What <laughs> happened with this? Innovation? Well, yes. uh, <laughs> you like it? You like well, it? Must, I must I ask the chat GPT about that, no? about that question. No? I, I think artificial intelligence is, uh, is very interesting in, in, in um, in a traditional uh, view of the dermatology, but uh, I focus my, my presentation in, in the things I can touch, I can feel, I can uh, buy my uh, clinic hospital, but maybe the artificial intelligence is far away, but um, I think it's a complement for the uh, dermatologist. I, I'm sure the three-dimensional photographies uh, they will uh, uh, complement the, 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 the photographies yeah. with an assessment or with artificial intelligence, and the patient uh, control the molds only in a, ma in a machine, without dermatologists. And in case of uh, doubts, ask for dermatologists. And we are the caring of the patients. You know? the, we care the patients, we remove the molds, we, uh, we have hands, and the mind probably will be, will be in the future uh, only an in artificial intelligence in dermatology. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And, and I would like to, to uh, make a question to Dr. Pimentel. Uh, it's because it's to solve a problem that I had the other day in my clinic, is how to calculate the PASI and the EASI in, in dark spin people, people, because I couldn't do this. The erythema is a, a problem. How do you solve this? It is quite a problem to calculate the PASI or even EASI or uh, SCORAT in atopic dermatitis in dark skin patients because sometimes we just tend to see more cirrhosis than more plaques or uh, the symptoms in the patients may vary. Uh, I think PASI, SCORAT or EASI are still a kind of subjective nor to very objective. It is subjected to the eye of the uh, investigator or the doctor, uh, but it is quite a challenge sometimes to do that. For us, it's kind of easy because my patients, all of my patients, most of them are type four, five, six or so, uh, or more than what Ruben says. Um, but it is not easy to make the diagnosis. That's the first things, thing, and then second, to uh, um, like aim at this type of uh, classifications or uh, score. Yeah, but it is not easy. But it should be uh, because I use an app. Uh -huh. So when, for the erythema, I, I didn't know how. Because the number, you don't get to see yes. erythema. So what you it, see is the brown or black or maybe the ash mm -hmm. type appearance or the ash type color. So those app need to be changed. Yes, absolutely. That's the thing. Those app, the atlas, the books need to be changed to include every type of skin yeah. uh, diseases in dermatology. And I think that's the main topic in this uh, uh, last one or two years, mm -hmm. that we need to change our knowledge about this kind of lesions so we can do those type of uh, classifications. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm afraid time is out, and I would like to thank everybody for attending, the speaker, the great talks that you have made, and all my colleagues and the Spanish Academy of Dermatology, 
uh, Julian, Yvonne to be here in this chair. It has been a pleasure, it has been an honor to be here and I would ask you all of the speakers just to come to the front line and all the attendees that still remain here just to take a, a picture all together and just a great applause for everybody. And here you have the last slide, very important. Don't miss this Sunday. We have the cocktail, the historical cocktail of Thilat, and you are invited, of course. Yes, and don't miss our cocktail tomorrow, <laughs> the <laughs> Spanish Academy of Dermatology. All of you are invited. Thank you. Thank you. See you next year.